I'm going to just going to go about how we think about games investing and why we think that games are really Europe's hidden gem. Uh, I don't understand why there's not more VCs, you know, looking at this space right now in Europe. Although there's going to be a panel with some of the really good ones um, in, I think, uh, the section after the next one. Um, so the first thing that we look at, obviously, that VCs will look at that we like, is the fact that it's a huge market, right? Uh, it's over a $100 billion market, you guys know this, and 42% uh, of that is mobile, and that's going, growing very fast. So that's one thing we really like. Another thing that we like is that the platforms continue to develop. Uh, you've got some really big players uh, in messaging, especially in China, all that, for whom games is very key and important. And so distribution is just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Third thing that we really like, this is from an investor perspective, is it's a very, very liquid market. Uh, it's actually m the most liquid market in tech. Uh, if you look at uh, billion dollar uh, companies, uh, about 80% of the billion dollar companies have either had an exit or an IPO. Uh, if you look at tech in general, that's more like, I think, below 40%. Um, so very, very interesting market. And also there's lots of exit at every level, you know, from 20 million to 10 billion. And we've seen lots of uh, recent exits, uh, like King, Supercell, Space Ape, and eRepublic Labs, which was my company that uh, we worked on with Chum. Um, another thing that we really like is the fast returns. Uh, so we know we always say as entrepreneur that overnight success tech takes 10 years. It actually, uh, for the least capable of us, so myself, it took me 10 years for Republic Labs, but some of these guys, super self example, have been much, much faster. Uh, so you think that sort of you know, liquidity arriving uh, faster compared to other tech companies. It's also very cash efficient. So for an entrepreneur, it's a great business, but for a VC, it's a great business as well, because usually, you do, usually you're going to do a Series A, maybe a Series B. You don't see a lot of Series Cs uh, in game businesses, because you, the moment it works, it becomes very, very profitable. Um, and then, of course, you've got incredible revenue growth. This is the supercell evolution of revenues from 2012, around 100 million, 2013, 892 million, 2014, you know, 1.7 billion. Uh, and then it kind of continued growing. So that's pretty nice growth. Um, another thing that is very interesting, and it's not just interesting for VCs, but also markets, public markets are starting to notice, is the revenue longevity. I mean, some of these games, uh, some of the top games have been going for over 10 years, 15 years. Um, that's on PC but also uh, on mobile, you know, a lot of these games have been, uh, these games have been going on for six years uh, or more. So that's really interesting. Another thing that we like as VCs is that usually once the studio started having some success, uh, replicating success is much, much easier. We see these teams, you know, going, doing hit after hit, the best ones only, of course. Um, another thing is there's very kind of deep European talent. Uh, a lot of startups have come from ex-members of you know, Ubisoft, Jagex, uh, Gameloft. Uh, some people are coming out of King and starting some really interesting companies. Um, and then, of course, uh, most of the Supercell team came from Digital Chocolate. Um, very little known factor. It's really um, games for Europe are a kind of unicorn factory. There's a lot of unicorns out there in China. Uh, but there's also a lot of in, uh, in Europe. Actually, here we have six uh, European players. Uh, if you had Paradox, uh, it's actually it's now worth two billion, uh, then there's actually a seventh. So if you compare that to actually the US players uh, that have been created uh, recently in terms of games, Europe definitely beats the US in terms of uh, game startups. So I think that's quite a good thing for us. So why is Atomico interesting? Uh, well, Atomico is a kind of a growth acceleration team, so it's not just like a big fund. We have 765 million euros under management, which makes us the lar largest single VC fund in Europe. Uh, but it's also uh, because of kind of the experience that we've had and the kind of people that we have on board. So, for example, Hilke is, uh, liked Atomico so much and he felt Atomico helped him so much. He's an entrepreneur in residence at Atomico, and so we work closely with him. Uh, we also work with Miko, uh, who's the other co-founder at Supercell. And obviously, there's some of the internal knowledge that we have through Matthias and myself and also Steven uh, to kind of help the companies that we invest in. Uh, also, obviously, a strong network. We have partners in China, we have partners in Japan, we have partners in the US. So we're able to put our entrepreneurs in uh, contact with the right people. One of the most often asked questions is, how do I get into China? Well, we know. How do I get into Japan? We know. We can help. Um, and then, obviously, the track record uh, is, uh, is quite good in terms of games. Uh, uh, we don't do a lot of investments. 
uh, when we do them, we're very serious about them. So the investments, again, Supercell, Rovio, and more recently, Bosa Studios here in London and Tea Time uh, in Iceland, which is a still kind of an undercover company, but that looks very, very promising. Um, so then the other thing that we really love, lo love about gaming is kind of powerful characters. There's some, some really interesting char characteristics about it. First of all is the audience reach. There's right now a billion people spending money. There's 2.2 billion players, but there's a billion people spending money playing games. So that's obviously a huge market. The scalability, what we love about this is that you launch and then you launch worldwide. You know, Google uh, Play and the App Store, they're amazing distribution platforms. Steam, very good distribution platform as well. Uh, so that's great. The rollout speed, you don't need the local presence, except in Asia. But basically, you know, you can launch your game um, with a small team in Romania and then have the number one market being the US without having any set, set foot in the US ever. That's great. We love that as VCs. Uh, the engagement potential, you know, we're seeing the number of hours that people spend playing games is also growing. The monetization, there are tons of ways to monetize in games, of course, with free-to-play, but also, you know, uh, the big guys are pushing subscriptions again, there's a lot of things happening. Advertising is very interesting in games, we're seeing new balls emerge. Um, and then the margins, great margins, you've got, you know, 30%, and this is after, app, you know, app store fees and all this stuff, you usually see 30% margins. You see very small teams like Supercell, 240 people uh, support, 2.1 billion dollars revenues. Not many companies can do that. So again, uh, really, really interesting. Very highly data-driven. VCs love that. They, lo they love their Excel spreadsheets and being able to check the data so that they feel, if they make a mistake, we don't feel too bad. We say, but the data was good. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> uh, but very highly data-driven. Of course, from an operational perspective, an entrepreneurial perspective, we know this is great because we can iterate, we can change, we can kill games really quickly. So we love that. We can be quick. Very competitive market. From an entrepreneur point of view, it sucks. From a VC point of view, it's actually great because the winners emerge and they really emerge. And the losers, well, they're clearly losers. So it's very tough from an entrepreneur point of view, but from a VC point of view, it's actually quite helpful. Um, and then the interesting thing, seeing probably the thing that you want to hear is when do we choose to invest? What's our kind of investment criteria? What do we look for in companies? Uh, when we're hunting for the, new, the, for the next supercell, what are we looking for? So obviously metrics are important. We say they're kind of a nice crutch. Uh, the problem is that no, not all metrics are created equal. I think all the entrepreneurs in the room will know that they're very different depending, depending on the genre of game, whether it's a casual game, a mid-core game, you know, a uh, hardcore game. I mean, try and have a 60% day one in a hardcore strategy MMO. Good luck. It's not going to happen. Uh, so, you know, metrics are very, very different, but that's, of course, we look at those and we have a nice kind of, you know, uh, view of, uh, of what these should be for, for, for casual, but also for mid-core, but even within specific genres, uh, they will vary quite a lot. Um, so that's, so metrics are important, we like to see them, but they're really not the most important thing. Uh, I would say the teams are critical. Um, and evalu evaluating a team is as important as the metrics. Actually, I think it's much more important uh, than that. So the things that we look in teams is, um, and here again, I can send you this. You can kind of you, you'll see in more detail the sort of questions and sort of things that we look at. But the first thing that we look at is, does a team have a real strong gaming DNA? You know, are they really passionate about games, or are they just tourists? You know, are they kind of just you know, they want to do the game they always dreamed of doing and they're tourists, or are they really people that are passionate about it? Do, we, do the teams have an almost telepathic connection between themselves? They've been working so long together, you know, they don't need to speak to uh, develop a game. You know, that's really important. Um, so, you know, a long history of working together, uh, very, 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 very key here. Uh, and then we like, you know, looking at, you know, at the mistakes, the scars, and the hunger to win. Now, I had a conversation today with one entrepreneur at lunch, and he was saying, I don't get it, you know, these guys, they're entrepreneurs, but they, they were almost going to make it, but they kept failing and failing and failing, and, and then, and then but they were almost there, and they gave up. And it was like, and, and what I was telling him is like, like, for me at least, in the Republic, it felt like we were always failing. We were never got it right. We, we kept failing, but we were, you know, always clinching, 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 until at some point, it just worked. And so that's kind of the, the grit that we're looking for uh, in teams. And obviously the technical talent, the capacity to execute um, is extremely important. You know, making the right tech, tech choices, fast iterative process of design, all sorts of stuff. Ideas are great, but execution in games is everything, as uh, most people in the room will know. Um, and the last thing that we really like, which is kind of the magic 
the little thing that's kind of difficult that really, I think, sets apart the good guys, the good companies that will make a nice lifestyle business or a nice kind of growth business but will not be an atomic investment is basically the creativity, the risk-taking, the ability to basically find new experience for the consumers, you know, not being afraid of taking creative, uh, creative lips, doing something different, you know? Uh, and that's extremely hard, you know? Not, you know, a lot of companies that we see do well, and they do Me Too games, and they're better at advertising, or they're better at this, or they've done that small iteration, and they're just better. The problem is that it's not very easy. It's kind of hard to protect, you know? It's not going to take you to the billion dollars or more, which is what, ideally, we're looking for as a large fund. Uh, so that's kind of the little magic uh, there. So in conclusion, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, winning big in gaming creates really powerful defensive modes, and that's what VCs like, you know? Um, so what we look for when we want to invest in a, in, in a games company is basically we want to see a combination of creative differentiation, so they've got something we haven't seen before, or it's maybe, or so maybe it's a mashup of two things out there, but that makes it entirely new. Um, so, and a very, very strong data-driven approach. And we think that you need to combine these two things to really win a tough market. And quite often, we see uh, studios that do very well, but they're either really good on the data-driven thing, and then, you know, they have this nice company that does well, or they're extremely creative, but, you know, they're not that strong on the, da on the, data, on the data side. So you need to combine these two things to really go to the next level. Um, and then, basically, um, the great thing about this is if you're able to then make these two things gel and you know, launch one, two, maybe three like really strong hit games, then you kind of get these huge economies of scale you know, uh, that we've seen with Supercell, where 200 people can you know, support a $2 billion revenue business, almost a billion dollar profit. And this is incredible, but there's lots of other examples, King and, and others, although they have a bit more staff, still very impressive ratios. And then what happens? The other thing is, um, the leading studios, they're able to control the talent because, you know, all game developers, you know, they want to, what, the really good ones, they want to work in companies, not, just that, not that they just have a great culture, but also that do very well. They want their games to be played by millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. So once you've got that kind of scale, it's actually much easier for you to retain the top talent. Not just because you can pay them, but because we know that game developers, you know, they, they, they really like what they do. They're really passionate about it. So they want to stay in that kind of, kind of environment. And then, so that's the first kind of big competitive mode that you have built to build. The second one is if you're able to build a strong brand and IP, then you kind of have this alloy effect on your KPIs. You know, we've all seen this, you know, game A is the same as game B. I don't get it. I've done the exact copy of Clash Royale. Why is my game as shitty KPIs? Well, because you've done the exact copy of Clash Royale number one. <laughs> and number two, because you're not fucking Clash Royale. <laughs> you know, you don't have the brand, the brand effect, and you probably don't have the same level of polish, you don't have the same kind of, you know, secret sauce behind it. But, you know, IP really drives superior KPIs. So this, you can do that by trying and do deals with Hollywood studios, but that's going to hurt your margins. But sometimes that works for certain studios, but the best thing you can do if you created Angry Birds IP, even if you have some rough times sometimes, you know you've got something really strong uh, to go for. So there's a really nice defensive mode there. And then the third thing is um, competition. Life's unfair. The moment you're the, you've got that billion dollar game with that kick-ass amazing team that doesn't want to leave, and you've got the marketing budget behind that and all that, you're basically sucking out the oxygen for, from the other guys. And it becomes very, very hard for other people to go in. It's still possible, but it's very hard. So that's what kind of really makes it um, super interesting. And I've managed to actually leave 10 minutes for questions. I'm very happy because I wanted to have five minutes for questions. Because I think the idea is most of you guys, how many here are entrepreneurs? Perfect. And how many of you are looking to raise? A few, okay. Less than half, that's interesting. So all the rest of you are doing amazingly well. <laughs> or you don't need to raise, or you've given up on raising. I don't know which one is it, it is. So, um, so, so, so you know, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm a VC as well. So uh, very happy to answer any questions that you have in a very kind of candid, uh, non-bullshit VC way. So please shoot, go ahead. Thank you very much, Alex, for the talk. My name is uh, David from a company called Fortune Fish. Um, 
what is the earliest VCs will get involved with the company? Generally, the, the, I guess the uh, concept would be that VCs get involved in maybe like a post-revenue, like post-success, et cetera. Um, there may be companies here which uh, are pre-revenue or, or have had a couple of failures, for example. Is that still possible for VC funding, or would you say that really you guys are looking to kind of get involved at a little, yeah. little bit later stage? Yeah, so it depends on, on, on the VC. So obviously you have some VCs that focus more kind of the, on the early stage. Uh, and you know, so you've got some ex excellent ones like, you know, like um, London Venture Partners, with whom we work quite a lot. Uh, you have also uh, my former investor at Edenvest, uh, Guillaume Latour from Level Up. Um, you have also great angels like Chris Lee. Who else? Initial Capital. Initial Capital. Index. Index also Balderton. does a bit of, of early stage. Balderton. Ballerton is doing early stage in games? Okay, that's new. Okay, good. Uh, so you've got a few VCs that do kind of the early stage. We at Atomico, we tend not to do too much early stage. We tend to kind of come in at product mar what we call product market fit. It's once you kind of have a, at least, at minimum, some really solid KPIs in kind of, uh, in kind of your, uh, your soft launch. But more ideally, you've kind of already launched a game and you're on, on the road to launching a second game and so stuff. Because we make checks of between 5 and 25 million euros. So we do large checks. But we make some exceptions for exceptional teams. Uh, so we've done recently with Tea Time, uh, which, where we've basically invested pre-revenue. So, um, so we can do early stage when we want to. Adam Davis from PlayerMaker. Uh, we yeah. build sports-focused mobile games. Uh, good overview of the market, but what areas actually excite you for the future or specific genres are you guys as a fund um, looking at? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I don't really believe that all the big drawers have become red oceans and that's impossible to do well. I mean, people were saying, oh, there's no way we're going to be able to do a mastery game and do well because, you know, King has taken over, right? And then you've got Gardenscape that shows up. Uh, you've got the guys from Peak Games that show up and do very well. Uh, so you can still do, do things in the kind of the genres that we used to. Same thing for our core strategy MMOs, for all that sort of stuff. So we think that all those genres are, um, are still interesting as long as you're able to innovate and come up with something new. Uh, obviously, right now, the talk of the town, everyone wants to do a battle royale. I think it's going to be a bloodbath. Uh, for the people that come after uh, Fortnite and, uh, and Player Unknown, uh, some people will maybe be able to do something good by putting a bit of um, a bit of innovation there. But I think it's going to be pretty tough. We like esports a lot, but we think esports is extremely challenging because you need to have the huge IP already with the lots of players behind it and all that. And it's kind of hard to understand from a VC perspective where the value is going to happen. Uh, you know, is the value going to be built at the league's uh, level? Is it going to be built at the team's level? Is it going to be built at the actual IP level, which are already controlled by the big studios? We think it's going to be more at the IP level, which are controlled by the big studios. And maybe some media companies will do well around that. So it's kind of, com kind of complex. But I think uh, maybe sports games are a bit um, underexploited. I mean, we've all seen the results and the success of um, is it Golf Clash. Yeah, Golf Clash. So I think the sports genre is a bit underexploited on the, on the platform. And I also think that the, um, the kind of... One, one good thing that the Battle Royale thing is that it's made first-person shooters more popular again. And it's made kind of more people play first-person shooters on mobile and get used to it. So I think that someone is going to come up with something a bit more adapted to mobile and going to do very well with that as well. So that's the sort of things that we're looking at. Hope that helps. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. Very informative. Uh, so I'm Fouad. Uh, I'm a co-founder of an indie game studio in Beirut, Lebanon. Great. Uh, so I have a question specifically relating to the data-driven approach. So we have a couple of games in our portfolio. And what we would like to do is to like, make a couple of prototypes and put them on the store and uh, do some A-B testing, do some retention testing, see which game performs better than others uh, so we can like, cancel one and go with the best option. You know? uh, uh, and of course, we iterate over this process as the development goes. But the problem is um, we did get an investment. It wasn't a very big investment, but it was good. So our budget is kind of tight. Um, so, so I'm really I'm looking for advice, like uh, Google Play Early Access program, free installs. Do you think it'll uh, it'll, it'll get us a statistically significant amount of users? Yeah, you'll get you'll get 
depending on your game, you'll get between tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of free installs. Tens of thousands. Yeah. Google Play Early Access Program, wow. my recommendation. And it's great for A-B testing and that. I love Apple, but Google in that <laughs> for that is okay. and, uh, pretty good. And anybody can get into the program, no strings attached? Yeah, yeah it's uh, available worldwide. It just says um, uh, on release or something like that. Yeah. yeah so yeah, that would yeah. be my recommendation, because you don't want to blow your money on, uh, yeah, exactly. on ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, All right cool. thanks. Um, I, th I think it's hand. more just for the benefit of everybody here in the room, especially <laughs> folks who um, you know, don't necessarily have connections to Atomico, right? Yeah. So I'm, t I'm talking on behalf of indie developers or, or guys you know, who don't have the track record of a BASA, who don't have the track record of a tea time that can get easier access to yourselves, index, initial, LVP, etc. Um, how do they get in contact with Atomico? Uh, I mean, you obviously had a pretty detailed set of criteria you look for, team, et cetera, something you know, unique, distinguishing, data-driven approach, et cetera, but how do they actually get in touch with you? I mean, you know, because yeah. let's be honest, a great idea can come from anywhere. Yeah. I mean, the best way to, um, to uh, basically capture our attention is obviously, I mean, cold emails are not ideal because if we don't know who you are, it's kind of hard for us to filter, but if you can basically uh, go through someone we trust, so a company we've invested in, or, um, or maybe someone like, like Sean that we know has good criteria, or different kind of people in the industry that know us. So that's a great way to capture our attention. So that's the first way. Uh, the second way is uh, we're gamers. We love games. So if your game is really cool, and then just you know, share it with me on Twitter, or actually do send me a cold email to cz to guess alexis at atomico.com. So, so we, will, we will definitely check it out. Uh, but usually uh, intros, uh, I mean, with me, because I'm a gamer, a cold email will work from time to time. But with most VCs, you need an intro. You need to find someone they trust that does an intro. Hello. Um, Jack from Playdio. I, um, I don't have a particular kind of games question, but I was just really interested in uh, how you felt about the uh, Vision Fund uh, in terms of the landscape of VC more broadly and the impact it might have over the coming 10 years or so. Oh, you mean the 100 billion yeah, soft yeah. bank yeah, uh, scary. fund? It sort of feels a bit like an yeah. elephant getting into a canoe or no, something. No, I think, I think it's great for the ecosystem. It's great. I mean, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, as an entrepreneur, we kept complaining that there wasn't enough VC money. And I think now there's probably you know, enough VC money, especially with the, VC, with, with, with the Vision Fund. So I think it's great for the ecosystem. Also for us as VCs, you know, very often you know, we like doing a Series A round, and then sometimes the company needs to uh, do another round, and so we need to do an up round, and we like to bring in you know, other people into our companies uh, that have uh, deep pockets as well. So I think it's actually quite good for the whole kind of ecosystem. Uh, I think it's a good thing. And then every single VC, they will always tell you, you know, we're not just about the money, you know, we can do other things, right? So I've tried to explain that a little bit with Atomico. Uh, you can believe it or not. Uh, personally, that's the reason I, I joined Atomico as a venture partner, because I saw that as something really different. Uh, um, so then I, I, th I see it as a positive. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if you're raising uh, money, feel free to send me an, an, an email, uh, alexis at atomico.com, or reach me on Twitter. Uh, just tell me you are here at the session, so that will be your intro. Uh, that will be easy. And if you're interested in getting the slides, because there was a few more explanations on the criteria, uh, please ask me. And also, if you go to the atomico.com website, we've actually done pretty long posts explaining in more detail how we select companies and why we invest and what, and what we think is interesting and sectors we're interested in. So I uh, hope that uh, proves useful to you guys. Thank you.